Hi everyone. Hey, How are you doing? Thank you so much for coming. I am reading from a book called The Thorn and the Blossom, which I wrote but would never have happened without Stephen, who was my wonderful editor on this project. Um, and he's here not as my editor, but as my co-reader today, and I'll explain why. Um, as you may or may not know, The Thorn and the Blossom is subtitled A Two-Sided Love Story, and it is literally a two-sided love story. If you slip it out of its slip case, there's one side with an E on it, and this is Evelyn's side of the story, and it's told from her perspective. So you can see that this is Evelyn's side, and there's a beautiful picture of Evelyn right here. And the other side has a B on it, and it's Brendan's side of the story. Um, and it has, this is a picture of actually Sir Gawain, whose story is embedded in this story. And uh, here's Brendan right on the back here. And it is literally a story told from two different perspectives, Evelyn's perspective <coughs> and Brendan's perspective. So I thought, how do I do a reading for a story that's unusual? If I just sit up here and read some of Evelyn's story to you or Brendan's story to you, that's not going to give you any sense of what the book's really about. So what I did was I took little bits and pieces of the two stories and interspersed them. Some are from Evelyn's perspective, some are from Brendan's perspective, and Stephen is here to read the ones from Brendan's perspective. So what you're going to hear today is actually one scene from The Thorn and the Blossom, and you're going to hear it from both perspectives. So some things that you hear about are going to happen uh, in both perspectives, you'll see, but, but what you'll be hearing is two different, two different versions of them. You're, you'll be hearing, you'll be seeing the same scene from Evelyn's eyes and from Brendan's eyes. And hopefully it will be fun to do and fun to listen to. Okay. Brendan? I have nothing to add to that. She borrowed a map of the town from Mr. Davies and started out, first down to the harbor to watch the water lap against the sides of the boats that had not gone out that day. The men making repairs or shouting to one another about things she couldn't understand, things that no doubt had to do with fishing. Then she walked up the main street, past the pub and the shop selling tobacco, knitting wool, antiques. She stopped to look into the window of the antique store at the china dogs and silver spoons and a collection of walking sticks. That was when she saw it, reflected in the window, Thorn and Son, booksellers. When she opened the door of the bookshop, a bell rang, but no one appeared. All she could see were shelves from floor to ceiling, old wooden shelves that looked as though they'd stood there for at least a century, filled with books. Not modern bestsellers or the latest cookbooks or decorating manuals. These had leather spines with a title stamped in gilt, or the sorts of cardboard covers that had once been popular, with the illustrations embossed right on the surface. Even the few paperbacks on the shelves looked old, their covers decorated in Art Deco style. He opened the office door, walked through, and said, were you looking for something specific? It wasn't a brilliant line, but it was the only one he could think of at the moment. She was holding a book that he knew, because that was the sort of thing he'd grown up knowing, it was worth about 50 pounds. He could hear his father's voice, kindly place that book back on the shelf, young lady could see his frown above the spectacles he'd worn as long as Brendan remembered. I'm sorry, she said. Here, I was just looking at it. He couldn't help grinning. She was an American then. He'd always wanted to go to America. She had warm brown eyes and freckles, light ones across her nose. She was even more attractive than he'd thought when he'd seen her standing in the street. Strands of hair had escaped from her braid and they curled around her face. You're allowed to look at the books, you know, he said. This is a bookstore. She didn't answer, and for a moment there was an awkward silence. I gather you're not from around here, he said. She picked one of the leather-covered volumes off a shelf and held it up to her nose. Yes, there it was, the intoxicating smell of old books. It was one of the reasons she'd wanted to study literature rather than attend law school. Were you looking for something specific? He was tall, wearing a faded t-shirt and jeans, more like a fisherman than someone she would have expected to find working in a bookstore. She noticed thick brown hair that was overdue for a cut, and rather nice eyes. Evelyn stepped back, startled. I'm sorry, here. She handed the book to him. I was just looking at it. He grinned. You're allowed to look at the books, you know. This is a bookstore, he said, gesturing toward the shelves. I gather you're not from around here. She laughed, partly with relief. What gave me away, the accent? 
Yes, and I already know all the pretty girls in clues. Where are you from, then? She could feel herself starting to blush. How embarrassing. It wasn't as though she never got compliments, although they were rare. The boys she dated at Harvard hadn't exactly been romantic types. But she wasn't a lot about to let him know that. Boston, and no, I don't know any of the Celtics. He laughed. Have you seen the town yet? I imagine you have if you've been up the main road. There isn't much more to it than that except Gawain's court. Mrs. Davies mentioned, what is it called? So you're staying at the Giant's Head. Not that there's anywhere else to stay in clues. Come on, then. It's only a couple of miles. Are you up for a bit of a hike? She was, but hesitated. What about the store? Won't you get in trouble for leaving? The store will take care of itself. It's off-season anyway. No one comes to clues in the off-season. Except crazy Americans, thought Evelyn. That was exactly the sort of thing her parents would worry about. If they knew she was here, they would call Dr. Birnbaum, ask if she should go back on the medication. Anyway, Dad's in London at an antiquarian book fair. I'm the son of Thorn and Son. Brendan Thorn, at your service. Evelyn Morgan. All right, where is this Gawain's court anyway? She laughed. He liked her laugh. It was natural and friendly. That didn't necessarily mean anything with girls. They could laugh for any reason, no reason at all. It didn't mean they liked you or wanted to go to the pub for a pint with you. But he wanted to hear her laugh again, wanted to keep her standing there among the books. What gave me away, she said. The accent? Yes, and I already know all the pretty girls in clues. Where are you from, then? You couldn't believe he just said that. He never flirted with girls. Well, not successfully. And she had a look on her face as though she couldn't quite believe he said it either. He thought American girls were used to getting compliments. Boston. And no, I don't know any of the Celtics. She turned as though to go. He wished he could think of something more interesting to say so he could keep her talking. Have you seen the town yet? He asked. I imagine you have if you've been up the main road. There isn't much more to it than that, except Gowan's Court. Mrs. Davies mentioned, what is it called? So you're staying at the Giant's Head. Not that there's anywhere else to stay in clues. The inn had been run by Mr. and Mrs. Davies for as long as he could remember. Come on then, it's only a couple of miles. Are you up for a bit of a hike? He'd grown up playing on the hilltop with its circle of standing stones. After he left for university, a team of archaeologists had dug there, hoping to find something like the gold ship that had been found on Pentor. They'd unearthed nothing, and he was glad. An archaeological find would have made Gowan's court less magical for him. He wanted it to stay what it was, the place where Gowan and Ellen had fought the giants. What about the store, she said. Won't you get in trouble for leaving? The store will take care of itself, he said. His father would be furious, he found out. But how would he? He was in London at one of those book fairs. Brendan had spent his childhood at book fairs, estate auctions, bookstores all over Great Britain. They had taught him that he loved books, just not selling them. He'd have to tell his father that soon. Anyway, I'm the son of Thorne and Son. Brendan Thorne, at your service. Evelyn Morgan, she said, holding out her hand. She had what he thought of as an American handshake firm, direct. Come on then, he said, and you might want to button up your cardigan. It's windy up there. Up where, she asked. You'll see. He held the door open for her and locked it behind them. It was on top of a hill. By the time they had climbed the steep path, Evelyn was breathing hard, although Brendan seemed barely affected. For the last part of the climb, he had to help her, pulling her by the hand. You'd get used to it if you grew up around here, he said. Evelyn concentrated on trying not to slip. <coughs> she could imagine the headline, American dies trying to climb hill in Cornwall. What would her mother say? That's just the sort of thing Evie would do. She never thinks about whom she might inconvenience. Imagining her mother's voice speaking to the other members of whichever, whichever fundraising committee she might be lunching with that day, Evelyn almost laughed out loud. But then there they were, at the top of the hill. Oh, she said. The first thing she saw was a circle of standing stones. They were twice as tall as she was. Most were upright, but some had fallen over with grass growing up their sides. Beyond them, she could see the sea sparkling. It was perfectly quiet except for bird song. There's a legend about this place, said Brendan. She could tell he was pleased by her reaction. 
Once, when Arthur and his knights were feasting at Camelot, a lady arrived at his court. She was Elowen, Queen of Cornwall, and she told Arthur that her country was plagued by giants. She asked if any of the knights of the Round Table were brave enough to ride with her to Cornwall and fight them. The giants were aided by a sorceress named Morva, daughter of McGill, the chief giant. Most of the knights were willing to face giants, but what could a knight do against a sorceress, they wanted to know. However, Gawain, who had fallen in love with Elowen at first sight, volunteered immediately. They fought the giants together, for Elowen was a sorceress herself. Most queens seemed to have been in those days. To protect Gawain from more of a sorcery, she gave him a suit of magical armor made of green metal shaped like leaves. Brendan sat on one of the fallen stones. Am I boring you? Not at all, Evelyn said. I took a class on medieval literature at Oxford. We studied Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but this story sounds different. Oxford is it, he said. Very impressive. Evelyn sat on the stone beside him, both pretty and impressive. Well, she was getting it with both barrels today, wasn't she? She couldn't help smiling. Yes, he said, it's different. This story was written in Cornwall around the 13th century. It's a sort of long poem in medieval Cornish. It was translated into English in the 19th century, but it's still largely out unknown outside this area. My dad used to tell it to me when I was a boy. So, what happened? Did they win? They walked up the main street, past the shops and then the houses, along the winding road he knew so well. By the time they reached the hill, he could tell she was getting tired. He had to help her up the last part of the path, where it was steepest. He was glad that it gave him an excuse to hold her hand. You'd get used to it if you grew up here, he said. Oh, she said, looking around. She seemed impressed. This had been his favorite place as a boy. He still remembered the story his father had told him, about how the giant McGill had come to Cornwall with his son Magog, and his daughter Morva, and the rest of his giant family. How they destroyed the countryside trampling crops, eating cows and sheep, drinking from the rivers until they were almost dry. The Cornish knights had fought bravery, but they were always defeated. Either the giants would bludgeon them, or Morva, who was a sorceress, would turn them into pigs. He still remembered laughing at the idea of a bunch of pigs running around in armor. Then Elowen, queen of Cornwall, had ridden to the court of King Arthur and asked the knights of the round table to fight the giants. Only Gawain, the bravest of them all, had volunteered. Evelyn was walking around, looking at the stones. Suddenly, she seemed to be standing in a halo of light. Brendan rubbed his eyes, but still he saw her standing there, the light all around her, as though it were a robe she was wearing, a crown on her head. And then, just as suddenly, it was gone. There's a legend about this place, he said, wondering what had just happened. Tell me, she said, sitting on one of the fallen stones. He sat beside her and looked down toward the clues. From the hilltop, you could see all the way to the harbor. He glanced at her, but she looked like a perfectly ordinary, although remarkably pretty, girl. He told her about the giants, about Elowen riding to Arthur's court and Gawain returning to Cornwall with her, about the suit of armor Elowen had given him, made of green metal shaped like leaves. It was magical and protected him from more of a sorcery. Am I boring you? he asked. Not at all. I took a class on medieval literature at Oxford. We studied Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, but this story sounds different. The way she said it, he could tell she thought he was a local boy, not someone who would ever be a graduate student at Oxford. He smiled. Oxford is it? Very impressive. He had published an article on the similarities between Sir Gowan and the Green Knight and Gowan's story. This story was written in Cornwall around the 13th century. It's sort of a long poem in medieval Cornish which he learned specifically so he could translate the story himself. It was translated into English in the 19th century, but it's still largely unknown outside this area. My dad used to tell it to me when I was a boy. So what happened? Did they win? He told her the story, as his father had told it to him each night before he fell asleep. Oh, oh they, they won, won all right. The, the giants, giants gathered, gathered on, on the hill, hill surrounding Gawain and Elwin. Gawain fought bravely, but even, but even he, he couldn't, couldn't conquer, conquer them alone. alone. Finally, fearing that he would be defeated despite his magical armor, Elowen cast a spell. It was the strongest she had, and it turned the giants to stone. Then Gawain lopped off their heads. One is supposed to have landed in clues, 
right, right where the giant's, giant's head stands today. today. There's, There's a rock in the garden that Mrs. Davies claims is the giant's head itself. But, but after lopping off all those stone heads, Gawain noticed that Elowen had collapsed. The spell had taken all her strength, and she lay dying. She promised him that they would be together again, that death could not defeat their love. But Morven had fallen in love with Gawain as well, and she was unaffected by Elowen's magic. Upon seeing them pledging their love to each other, she shrieked with anger and cast her own curse. Elowen could not be with the man she loved for a thousand years. With her last breath, Elowen told Gawain that she would be with him again after the thousand years had passed. Have patience, love, and we shall meet again, as surely as wild roses had their thorns, for weary years eventually pass. It's not a great translation, he said. Very Victorian. That's terrible, said Evelyn. Not the translation, I mean, the idea. A thousand years. Well, at least she'd know he truly loved her after that. Brendan looked out toward the sea, a serious expression on his face. Oh, so he was one of those romantic types. I suppose, said Evelyn. Still, who wants to wait around that long for a boyfriend? Oh, you're a cynic. How American. He stood up. Come on, I'm going to take you to the pub for some real Cornish cider. That's not American, she said. That's just me. She stood to and looked around one last time at Gawain's court with its circle of standing stones. It had definitely been worth the climb. That was from the 19th century translation by Ewan Tregillis, who had been the minister of the Anglican Church at Pengarth. It's not a great translation, he said. Very Victorian. For his article, Brendan hadn't translated the entire poem, but he could. And should, he suddenly realized. For the past year, he'd been wondering what to do for his doctoral thesis, whether he should expand his article into a book. But this idea, a new translation of The Tale of the Green Knight, was perfect. That's terrible. Not the translation, I mean, the idea. In a thousand years? At least she'd know he truly loved her, he said. Instantly, he regretted the words. She was going to think he was some sort of romantic sap. <laughs> I suppose. Still, who wants to wait around that long for a boyfriend? Yep, he'd done it. Put himself into the romantic sap category. Come on, he said. I'm going to take you to the pub for some real, for some real Cornish cider. There was nothing romantic or sappy about that. <laughs>